Welcome to Redefining Medicine, an intimate and personalized program that illustrates a different side of the practice of medicine. Our in-depth conversations will focus on the physicians and practitioners who are redefining medicine through their integrative, functional, and holistic approach to health and well-being. Our special guest this week is Dr. Douglas Harrington, recorded on-site at the 29th Annual AFRM Congress in Las Vegas. We'll be back with our interview with Dr. Harrington after this brief message from our sponsor. Hey there, listeners. It's your host of the weekly podcast, Redefining Medicine. I have a question for you. How much time do you spend ordering functional lab tests for your patients? Ordering from multiple lab companies for hundreds of patients can quickly turn into hours of admin time. But there's a new way to order lab tests that I'm excited to share with you. Rupa Health is a tool that lets you order 20 plus specialty labs in a single portal. You can order all tests you normally do from companies like Dutch, Vibrant, Genova, and Great Plains, and so many more. Imagine you're ordering a hormone panel for a patient that includes tests from three different labs, You have to log into three different websites to place separate orders and then come back weeks later to check tracking number and download results. Rupa eliminates all of that by having all ordering, tracking, and results in a single place. And they also handle invoices, tracking shipments, automated follow-ups, personalized instructions for completing tests, and so much more. The best part about Rupa, it's free for all practitioners. Go to rupahealth.com. Dot com. That's R-U-P-A health.com to join a live demo or sign up to see how it works. Now let's get back to today's show. We're so happy to welcome Dr. Douglas Harrington to the podcast today. He's a critical care medical specialist with over 35 years of experience in the medical field. Welcome. Thank We're you. so happy to nice talk to be, with you. Nice to be here. Great. Wow, over 35 years. Yeah, Jeez. do I look that old? <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> it must be all that anti-aging research. Yeah, that's exactly what I do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what made you decide to want to become a doctor in the first place, and what steps did you take? Um, well, I, I grew up in a very rural area of Montana, and uh, it was actually a state hospital. My dad was the uh, administrator, and I was just fascinated with all the stuff that went on there. and. We had a TB hospital nearby in those days. They actually isolated TB patients. And, uh, and I thought, and it was around the era of Marcus Welby. You didn't recognize that name, okay. I don't, but. Okay, well this <laughs> was like a doctor more. that did everything on TV. He did neurosurgery, he did cancer surgery, he did. So I wanted to be Marcus Welby. Okay. And that's how I got into it. That's interesting, okay. Mm-hmm. So he's like your role model? He was, yeah, yeah, <laughs> but many years before you were born, so, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so what challenges and barriers have you faced with this style of practice, and also especially over the past year and a half? Um, well, I predominantly do preventive cardiology, and uh, we also develop tests for things like cancer recurrence or to try and predict those sorts of things. And, um, you know, when COVID first hit, our, uh, our volume of patients and whatnot dropped pretty dramatically. Everybody shut down. Mm-hmm. But we're lucky we have a good group of people and we have been working remotely and using Zoom and things like that. So we just shifted. It was a big shift. And uh, then we were asked by uh, a number of municipalities in California to go into some areas that nobody else would go into and do COVID testing. So we put a team together with our uh, not-for-profit foundation. It's called the Garda Heart Foundation. Okay. And we went into places like South Central LA, Crenshaw, Baldwin Hills, um, you know, th- those sorts of places, Watts. And we tested thousands of patients and it was, we had 10 tents and we had all volunteers and uh, it was a great experience for all of our team and for us. And we, we used that as a way of keeping going during a time when everything slowed down. And during the process, we also use the opportunity to educate people on how to protect themselves. And, and it, it turned out to be a really good experience for all of our team. They grew, we grew from it, and we're happy to be here. 
still. Yeah, I'm sure they were really happy to have you because it's been <clears throat> a really tough time. Yeah, you know, it was interesting because uh, a lot of the cities were not able to get adequate information on the number of COVID patients, and we were doing serology as well. And the reason we were doing that is because everybody that was being tested had to have symptoms at the time, so they didn't really know what the true prevalence of the disease was at the time. So we did serology. Turns out about half or a little bit more than half didn't even know they ever had COVID, but they were positive for the antibodies. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was actually very important information for the public health sector because then it became apparent that um, people could spread it without knowing they had it. And, uh, you know, a lot of the younger people were asymptomatic. They had no symptoms, you know, so it turned out to be a good thing for everybody. So, uh, conventional medicine is developing guidelines for treating all disorders, and practitioners are not only encouraged, but often feel pressured to practice within those guidelines. Do you feel that's helping or harming the advancement of medicine? Oh, I'm, uh, I'm definitely going to say it's harming the advancement of medicine for the following reason. Guidelines are extremely conservative and about 15 years behind the technology that's available. and. Uh, one of my favorite things to talk about is there was a physician down in San Diego who I believe was a neurologist and he advanced a theory that a protein that was a living protein was responsible for a disease called the Jakob Creutzfeldt disease and he got fired and 10 years later he got the Nobel Prize. And then again in Australia there was a pathologist who had identified that Helicobacter pylority was responsible for ulcers and and stomach cancer, and he also got fired, and 10 years later he got the Nobel Prize. And my point in that is most of the advancements come from outside mainstream medicine. You know, obviously they do some good things, but uh, people used to make fun of microbiome studies, you know, the, and now uh, mainstream medicine has suddenly decided, well, maybe that's kind of important, and we know it's extremely important. I mean, you've got 12 trillion bacteria in your body and how they interact with your body determines whether you're depressed or whether your immune system works or whether you get cancer or not. So I, I think the important thing is to realize that um, it's not a simple, you come in, you have a disease, we give you a pill and we'll see you in six months. You have to treat the whole patient. You have to realize that most disease is due to lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And if you don't actually dig into what's going on with the patient, giving them a medicine is just a Band-Aid on a much bigger problem. And so I think the, um, the people that we see are most successful with their patients are people who don't wait for you to get sick. They advance pre you know, prevention. Mm -hmm. And they also take a more integrative approach to things, which is they'll use supplements, they'll use lifestyle. Uh, they'll use medications if they need to, but you, you really let the patient tell you what's going on with them, and, and it, it's far more successful, you know. Mm -hmm. So what are the steps that a patient would take to get to you? Would they go to their primary doctor if they're having symptoms, and then they would re their doctor would recommend them to you for the testing? Well, I'm kind of a doctor for other doctors, so I do a lot of consults for other doctors with patients, and then we do a lot of... Um, uh, most of the time the patients I'm seeing are patients who were tested with our pulse cardiac tests mm -hmm. or diabetes predict and uh, we typically try and, and counsel them but in such a way that we can refer them to a practitioner who can follow them long term and we look for the style of doctor that they're interested in so we're, we're definitely extremely fond of integrative practices where they actually take care of the patient and don't just look at the disease. Because, I mean, if you think about it, the disease model is a failure. If you wait for somebody to get sick, you have really not helped, you know. Yeah. And so we need to change that whole paradigm in medicine. And I think, you know, A4M is an example of where they're not waiting for those things. They're looking for ways to educate people and, and get them to think more about the whole person and use all different modalities, you know. So. Yeah, absolutely. So when your patients come to you, do you give them habits for a healthy lifestyle? Do you recommend those tips to them before sending them off to uh, a Yeah, we, we <laughs> actually have, we call them medical science liaisons who are trained to 
do a very simple lifestyle audit. And I, I will tell you that it turns out that the majority of problems are caused by diet and then lack of exercise, stress, lack of sleep, non-compliance um, non with supplements or medications. Mm -hmm. And so we try not to make it overly complex. So for example, in Spain, they're very famous for their hams and their sausages, you know, the processed meats. Mm -hmm. But if you look at their actual diet, only 15% of it is processed foods. And they have a lot of farm to table foods, so their vegetables are very fresh. And they've also outlawed glyphosate, which is, uh, you know, it's Roundup, it's a weed killer. And uh, we've genetically engineered most of our plants in this country, especially soybean and, and red wheat, uh, to withstand it. And the problem is it, it gets into your diet, even if you clean it as much as you can. It damages the microbiome in your gut and alters the way that your body sees the world. And in the U.S., 60% of our diet is processed food. So it's no wonder that we have an epidemic of diabetes, of heart disease, of cancer, particularly in young women under the age of 40. And so if we're ever really going to get our arms around this, we have to start asking for clean food, whole food, not processed food. And we need to stop allowing... Um, it's, it's almost like the military industrial complex. The medical industrial complex is designed around money made from people being sick. Mm -hmm. And we should turn that whole paradigm around, which is what integrative practices typically do, and try and focus on preventing disease in the first place through whatever lifestyle mod and whatnot. But your question was really, what do I do? I start with the diet part. And we don't put people on diets. I tell people diet's a four-letter word. The first three letters are die. Don't do it. And if you put somebody on a diet, all the evidence says that within a year they'll be off it and they'll gain their weight back and then some. And so what we try and do is we do a little nutrition audit on them and mm -hmm. we look to see what things they're doing correctly and we leave those alone. We say, keep doing those, those are great. But we get people that do things like they think that fruit on the bottom, non-fat yogurt is a healthy thing, okay? And what we do is we teach them to read the label you see, oh my God, there's so much sugar in this, you know? And really, honestly, in our diet, sugar and carbs are the biggest culprits. Mm -hmm. And uh, they think things like agave syrup is healthy because it's as natural. It's more heavily processed than corn syrup. And so if you tweak those little things, um, you make huge improvements in their lives. And we don't have to spend a lot of time educating them, but we do get them to do the, these things. And so I think on the exercise side, because exercise has huge benefit, but it's not cardio. Mm -hmm. So most people, you know, if we ask people, do you exercise? And they say, yes, 90% of them are only doing cardio. The problem with cardio is any motion is good for you, but cardio only gives you an afterburn of up to four hours, which means your metabolism is still going. Um, and you don't get secretion of a hormone called arisen. If you do any resistance training, which can be bands, it can be planks, it can be pull-ups, sit-ups, it can be kettlebells, one of my favorite, dumbbells, barbells, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. As little as 30 minutes a week will reduce your risk of having a heart attack by up to 23%. And Only the, 30 minutes a week, 30 okay. minutes a week. Everyone that's should how, be doing that. <laughs> yeah, no, that's how powerful resistance training is compared to cardio. Now, the other thing is there is a hormone that was recently discovered called arisen. Mm -hmm. And it's only secreted when you stress the muscles, not from cardio. Cardio is repetitive actions with muscle memory. But if you stress the muscles, stretch them and stress them, you secrete this arisen, it makes you more insulin sensitive. It converts white fat to bright fat. Bright fat is like the brown fat you're born with as a baby. It's anti-inflammatory and metabolically active. And it also uh, strengthens your ligaments and tendons and bones without any medication, and um, it resets your thermoregulatory system to burn a few more calories permanently. So if I do anything with patients, it's, look, I don't want you to stop if you like riding your bike or running or doing the treadmill, mm -hmm. but at least, you know, two or three times a week, spend 15 to 30 minutes just doing kettlebells or dumbbells or planks, something easy, mm -hmm. has a huge benefit. Those two things alone are massively helpful to people's health. Well, thank you for all these tips. They're really helpful, and I'm sure everyone will love hearing them. 
Yeah, well, you know, I got <laughs> on my high horse here, so. <laughs> no, it's been very interesting, so thank Good. you. Well, thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. <laughs> it was really a pleasure. Thank you.